I want to talk to you about sin today. You guys already talking about sin? Now, I got to tell you, lots of times in the world today, as I look on social media, it seems like everybody's talking about somebody else's sin. Have you noticed that? And I know one thing for me personally, your sin, you're all worse than me. I'm the least sinner in here, right? I mean, that's human nature. I'm, I don't mean that. But that's kind of the way we operate. I mean, that's why Jesus had to have that whole conversation. We were talking about the Sermon on the Mount last week. And, and in chapter 7, he has this, this whole conversation. We didn't preach on it last week, but it's in that sermon about you got to take the plank out of your own eye before you deal with the guy's speck, right? Because we're way worse than other people, but we just tend to think that, you know. A friend of mine has a T-shirt. He's a Christian guy. And he has a T-shirt. He says, Jesus loves all of us, but I'm his favorite. And, and you know, and that, I was like, you've got to stop wearing that and do not wear that in my presence because I'm his favorite. <clears throat> you've got to stick with it, you know, every minute. But I'm sorry, if I've already lost you, stick around. It gets better. It really, really does. Uh, but, yeah, I, I want to talk about sin today, but I want to talk about my sin. Not my sin. Your sin and my sin. Our sin. Our personal sin. Sin. I want to talk about that today. Um, our sermon title is Dealing with Sin. And you may be already going, oh man, I don't think I want to deal with this today. I'm really, I'm really hoping, because where this passage came from that I'm going to share with you today, I, it was in my daily reading, and, and, I, and I read through it, and then I got done and I went, wow, wow. let me go back and do that again. And, and just, just full disclosure, it's not my first time reading the Bible, but it's an amazing thing to me. Maybe some of you have discovered this. You can read the same passage today, read it again in a year or two years or five years, and it can say entirely different things to you, depending on where you are on your walk, right? Either up or down, right? So um, the passage we're going to investigate this morning is in the Psalms. Psalm 32. I have a very good friend who challenged me one time. He said, I don't think there's a lot of theology in the book of Psalms. I said, man, you need to read that a few dozen more times. There's tons of theology in, in the Psalms. And um, this particular Psalm, as I was reading it the other morning, um, I was actually in the midst of praying about what the Lord would direct me to. And in and, and my daily Bible reading, I don't look at it as preparation for sermons. It's for me. It's for me. All right. So realize that when I was reading this, I was reading it for me at first. And then the Lord said, you know, you might want to share that with somebody. So that became the, the basis for our sermon today. But what I like about this is that unlike sometimes humanly where we try to kind of beat up people about sin, this really isn't a beat down. This is more an encouragement. It's a teaching psalm, if you will. And so, again, we're in Psalm 32, and, and oftentimes when I, when I teach or preach out of the Psalms, I, I find that I can't do the whole Psalm. It, 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 sub, Subject-wise, it, it, it doesn't stay necessarily right where I want it to, um, or it's just too long, or, or whatever. But this particular Psalm, being that it's only 11 verses long, we can do the whole thing, and we'll still be out of here in a reasonable amount of time. So that's pretty cool. I like that. I like when that happens. So let me read this to you. And then we'll go back and we'll glean a few things. Psalm 32. A psalm of David, a contemplation. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. We'll get into what Selah is all about in a minute or two. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. 
I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. It's a great song. You're all great. All 150 of them are great. But this one just this week has really got my mind racing and my heart racing as well. Many, many years ago, almost 30 years ago now, I think, a group came to the church that I was a member of at the time. This is prior to, to me being called to the ministry. Christine and I had only been married a very short time at that point. And they came and did something that would be almost uncall, unheard of in the 21st century. We had a 10-day revival meeting. You guys even know what that looks like? Those, those are rare, right? When I was growing up as a kid, we'd have... A week-long revival meeting. They bring in the evangelist and the special music guy. And that's back in the days when churches didn't always have AC. And it'd be hot and sweaty in the middle of July. And whoo, just great memories. But um, by the time I was an adult, most revival meetings had been reduced to a long weekend. Because that's all the time anybody had. They were too busy. And so when these guys showed up in 1994... And they said, we're going to be here for 10 days. We're thinking, ain't no way. Let me tell you, the Lord used them greatly. And the place was packed every single night. And it was a transformative time. Um, if you ever have an opportunity, their ministry is still in existence. It's called Life Action Ministries. If they ever show up anywhere you are, go. You will be blessed. But one of the things that the lead speaker talked about that week, his name was Steve Hammock, is he talked about having a short sin account with God and that's never left me a short sin account even as I said those words I got chicken skin that's that's goosebumps for those of you that aren't from here a short sin account in other words don't let it pile up but keep it real with God about where you are you'll notice in the first two verses of this passage it talks about that it says that we're blessed when our, our sins are forgiven. And that word blessed there is the same word that you see, uh, this is Hebrew, but over in the Greek, the New Testament, in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the. That word means to be happy. And that's not some happiness that's generated by the fact that you've got a fat bank account or that you've just got a, a full belly or any of that thing. It's the blessings that come from knowing the Lord. And that happiness and gladness that comes from knowing Him and having an assurance of where your eternity is based. But you'll notice here that He actually uses, and, and this, is, this is Hebrew poetry. And one of the things, if you spend 10 minutes looking into Hebrew poetry, just go, go Google it. Somewhere in the first probably two or three different articles that you pick up, you're going to see the word parallelism. In other words, in Hebrew poetry, they tend to say the same thing again and again and again, or the opposite, or however, whatever kind of parallelism. But what it, they're trying to do is they're trying to cement an idea in your mind. And in the case of this passage, the, the parallelism gathers not one, not two, but three different words for sin in these first couple of verses. There's the word transgression. Transgression means defiance or rebellion. I've had a little bit of that in my life. Pretty much the Lord says, go left. I say, no, I think right will be better for me. The Lord says, go up. I say, no, I think down would be preferable. I don't know if any of the other rest of you guys have been that way, but I think in my natural state, I wake up and I rebel. That's just who I am. I think I know the best way. How ridiculous is that? <laughs> the God of the universe. And I'm telling him, I think I got it better than he does. Um, pretty silly. Transgression. The second word is the word sin. And if you know the New Testament at all, it's hamartia is the word. It means to miss the mark. It's the same word that's here. But there's a sense of not just missing the mark of God's perfection, but doing it on purpose. You meant to. I don't want to do good. That's that idea. And then thirdly, the word is iniquity. And this, this kind of is an umbrella term over everything else. And it really talks about a very settled 
In other words, I am good in this place. A settled state of lawlessness and a lack of respect for God's will. Now, I started off this whole sermon by talking about how we look at sin like at other sin. There's a lot of that in the world today. There is a lawlessness. There is an iniquity that has gripped our society today. And, and I tell you, I, I just pray for the young people of this, of this world because it is dangling out there in a way that I don't think I've ever seen it dangled in my lifetime. And it is so in their face compared to the way it was. I grew up and there were three channels on TV. You know, I used to think that I wanted to be a young, you know, I wanted to kind of speak like I'm a young person. I'm not young anymore. So I'm not even going to try to fool you guys anymore. A friend of mine wrote me a note last week and he asked me how my birthday was and me and some other unnamed person here just turned 60. So, um, you know, I told him, <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, I've been trying to convince everybody that 60 is a new 30. I said, but I'm, I don't know, I might be failing at that. And he said, well, I'm turning 59. I'm not even trying to, I'm not even trying to fool myself on that. But when I was a kid, there were three channels on television. Three. And TV went off at, after, after uh, Carson, right? And there'd be a test pattern till the morning. And uh, uh, social media was hanging out down at the five and dime with somebody over a Coke, that was what was social back then. And, and I just bring this up because I think about how bullying has become a part of young people's lives today because they can't get away from it. They go home and they, they open up their computers and it's there in front of them. At least when you were bullied when you were a kid, at my time, you went home and you kind of got away from it. Now you can't. And so this iniquity that is in our world today is right there in front of everybody all the time. This settled state of lawlessness but that's the word that he's using here but then he gives us three words for god's forgiveness isn't that great right there's always a remedy to the world right he uses the word forgiveness that means to take away or to carry off that idea of removing completely there's the word covered and another word here very big very big um theological word would be the word atonement to be atoned for to pay the price for something there's a picture here of the blood of the sacrifice and again the psalms are in the old testament this is prior to jesus christ so this would be the sacrifices in the tabernacle and then the temple is what we're looking at here in the blood but that blood was just a covering it could not forgive sin the book of hebrews explains that only through the blood of jesus christ can there be the forgiveness of sin the atonement the true atonement the paying the price for your sin and for my sin, all right? And then thirdly, there's this word impute, and that means to charge or to account. And um, boy, that's a, that's a huge word, but just suffice it to say that, that when you come to know Jesus Christ, then his righteousness is accounted to us, and that sin is taken away, that it's no longer charged to us, which is a beautiful picture. But guys, behind all of that is this little phrase, and I think this is the one that caught my attention the other day. The last phrase in verse 2. Did you see that? He says, Bless, again, look at 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And then listen to this. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. What is he saying there? Folks, what he's saying there is, if we really want to have the forgiveness that God provides through Jesus Christ and then the cleansing that he gives us on a daily basis, once you know him, you've got to get real with God. You've got to stop fooling yourself that somehow that you're not a sinner, that somehow that you don't fall short of his perfection. And I got to tell you, I see that in so many Christians that, that they're, they're leading this life of, of bitterness. They're leading this life of, unsatisfac of dissatisfaction. They're leading a life of, of really not happiness, of not blessedness, because they've not gotten real with God about their sin on a regular basis. They've not kept that short sin account. And guys, I got to tell you, it's not one of those things where if you sin and you sin to a certain extent that the next sin that comes in pushes that oldest sin off the shelf and you no longer got to deal with it. It doesn't work that way. It just adds and adds and adds and adds and adds. Christine was, uh, she has an aunt that's passed away, but she used to paint her house every, ready, 
single year. She would paint the entire interior of her house. And we used to joke that at some point she was going to paint it so much that the walls were going to come together. Right? And so I mean it layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. And folks, not being funny, that's how sin is if it is unconfessed. It just adds and adds and adds. I have a friend named Hank, and he was talking about, he said, I got to a point in my life not too long ago, and this was a long time ago, but at the point he was telling me, he said, I got to this point in my life not too long ago where I'd kind of come to loggerheads with God. And me and God weren't seeing eye to eye on something. And he said, so I went to him, and he was serious, and he wasn't a serious guy very often, but he said, I seriously went to the Lord, and he said, Lord, I'm not ready to deal with this yet. Can we just put a pin in it and go on around and keep going? He said, you know, he didn't let me get away with that, not for one second. And that's the way our God is. He wants you to deal with the times that you rebel against him. The times that you sin and willfully miss the mark. The time that you decide to live in a life of iniquity instead of coming to him in humility and asking him for forgiveness. And so this this just i'm just going to be just totally up front with you guys this hit me like a ton of bricks this week because when i looked at that i thought i i the lord said to me not necessarily a, a verbal word but they spoke to my heart and said in what ways are you fooling yourself about your sin and me and i'll just put that back out to you guys i'm not going to tell you what he and i talked about because i don't think we need to have that conversation but are there ways this morning as you sit here where you're fooling yourself because i guess what guess what you're not fooling god he knows it all he knew you were going to do it before you did it he knew when you did it he hasn't forgotten now he can put it his way as far as the east is from the west he can forget it ever happened but you have to confess it first all right so it just got really quiet in here all right Remember I said the word Selah is in this passage. And there's three Selahs in this passage. And, the, and, and, and there's been some question about what the word Selah means. But typically what scholars say is that the word Selah is, is an instruction to the reader, to the worshiper, to pause and to meditate upon what has just been said. And you'll notice that in this psalm there are three Selahs. And so if you will, I'm going to use that as part of the outline this morning. And so... This isn't, any, this isn't any highfalutin theology here, but I want to talk to you about Selah 1, Selah 2, and Selah 3. What are they telling us? What are we supposed to be meditating upon here? The first Selah is that there is a strain in the life of a human being when they have unconfessed sin. There's certainly strain in the life of a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And for the believer who's accepted Jesus but has not confessed sin, there is strain as well. Let me read these verses again because it's so evident when you read them. He says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. What is he talking about to keep silent? What he's saying is, I chose not to confess to God my sin. And imagine the picture. He zipped it. And God's, God's standing there going, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And he's, you know, he's like, beautiful day today, Lord. And I think this is where we get caught up in prayer lots of times, right? We want to praise God. We, we, want, to, we want to ask Him for stuff. And he's going, there's an 800-pound gorilla in the room we've not dealt with yet. And that's your sin. I think it's Psalm 66, 18 says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. And so, guys, I want you to just think about this. If your prayers feel like they're pinging off the ceiling, if you really feel like you're not getting a lot of traction in your prayers these days, Lord, Show me my sin. And I'm going to say something, and I hope it doesn't get taken out of context. It may not be something that to you is that big a deal. Right? I mean, it, 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 it probably is not going to be that you forgot to ask the Lord to forgive you for knocking off a liquor store or something. Okay? I mean, I'm just talking big stuff, right? Lord, forgive me for running over that guy, right? I mean, you're not going to forget that kind of stuff. 
Hopefully none of you have done that. And I don't I don't I don't mean to make light of those kind of things. Right. I mean, that's that's in our human mind. That's big. But so often it's the stuff that we've gotten so used to doing that we forget to ask. We forget to ask. By the way, we need to get victory over that, by the way. If we're asking the same forgiveness again and again and again and again, and 37 years later we're still asking forgiveness for it, there seems to be some sort of problem uh, with, with repentance that needs to be dealt with there. But guys, when we don't confess, and, and by the way, the word confess means to agree with God. That's all that means. To confess means to agree. And so when we don't, confess what we're doing is we're saying god i reject your forgiveness i don't want your forgiveness i'd rather kind of just wallow in my sin and what we see here in this psalm is really a picture of god's conviction and correction did you see it there where he says for day and night your hand was heavy upon me you guys ever had that feeling where, where, where God is just on you. It's conviction. There's, there's this heaviness about your life. And you're going, I don't know what this is. I do. It's God. He's saying, fix this. Let, let's get back to our relationship. Let's get back to getting you moving forward. Let's get back to the blessedness that should be the part of your life. Because He is not just going to let you savor that. He's not. All right? Come back to me in a year. I'll tell you the same thing. God is not going to let you savor your sin. He wants you to have victory over that. He has something for you to do. And you can't get it done if you're hanging on to that. He also talks here about this, this phrase, your, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. You say, well, what does that exactly mean? Well, that word vitality, it, it really comes back to a word that means juice. You, th- you ever heard that phrase, and we let our juices flow, right? I mean, this is the idea that the juices of his life have been dried up can't get a drink that dry that, that that quenches anymore he's just life stinks i think this is a picture honestly this is a picture of depression this is a picture of somebody that has run headlong into god doesn't want to change and they're just like laid out going i don't feel like it today i don't feel like it today so maybe this will offend if it does get over it grumpy bitter believers probably have unconfessed sin in their lives i don't i think that is an oxymoron grumpy christian agreed can i get an amen on that grumpy christian that's an oxymoron right i mean that that's just ridiculous i'm not please don't read that to say well pastor brusco are you saying i can't ever have a bad day got that t-shirt all right yes we can all have bad days all right but, but, but it's, it's when we get to the point where it's just bad day after bad day after bad day because we have not confessed to the Lord. By the way, we're supposed to give thanks in all things, but I struggle with that too, so we'll keep moving. The thing is, what I've seen with, with this type of individual, and I've, I've run into quite a few of them, is oftentimes what they'll do is they'll blame others as opposed to looking inside to see what the problem is. You don't know what they did to me. Go look at Matthew 18 if you need to know about that. Right. I mean, that's that's just kind of the hallmark for that where where, you know, how can we expect and he will. How can we expect the Lord? Well, how can we expect the Lord to forgive us when we have unforgiveness in our heart? Right. That's the whole point that Jesus makes in Matthew 18. Let me say this to you here, and I I don't know if there's anybody here. That doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ at this point, but I'd be remiss not to say this out loud. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, Lord, you've never asked him to become the Lord of your life. You've never come to him and you've never said to him, Lord, I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me for my sin. And I proclaim you as the Savior and Lord of my life. I lay down my life and I follow you. If you've never done that in your life, just understand this, because I want to go back to this idea of being silent. Because I hear people say this. Well, I'm not ready to make a decision about Jesus Christ. If you're not ready to make a decision, you've already made the decision to not accept Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground. You either accept or you reject. To set, There is no fence setting sitting with Jesus Christ. You either accept or you deny. The Bible is very clear about that. So if you're sitting here today and you say, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not ready to make that decision. You've already made it. But 
today you can repent of that. When we're done this morning, we're going to have a prayer. And afterwards, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, Lord, I would implore you, please come talk to me. Grab me. Grab somebody. But grab me, hopefully, and let me talk to you about what salvation is all about. The most important thing you will do today, this week, this month, this year, or your entire life is to know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Because literally, your eternal life depends on it. So don't leave here today. If you're here, don't think it was an accident. You're here because the Lord wanted you to hear that today and to know Him as your Savior. So law number one, there's a strain of unconfessed sin. The second law is God is faithful when we confess. Amen to that. Verses 5 and 6, it says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Listen, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. That's actually verse 5, just verse 5. There's a huge word here we need to grab on to. He said, I acknowledged. This word means full knowledge. The same word in the Hebrew is used over and over again in the Old Testament when it talks about Abraham knew his wife Sarah. Right? When it talks about intimacy among a man and a woman, that's the same word. Full knowledge. What's interesting about this is it's the word yada, which is I think where maybe they get the yada, yada, yada. You guys know what I'm talking about? Right? But don't yada, yada God. All right? You don't want to be yada, yada God. You want to come in with, not like, well, I'm going to gloss over it, right? That's what yada, yada is all about. You just say, you know, yeah, yada, yada. That's exactly the opposite of where we need to be with God. We need to come in full disclosure. And tell him everything. And you think, and you think, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I think, I think the way we typically come to the Lord is, well, Lord, forgive me of my sin. That's pretty substandard. I know if I came to Christine and say, Christine, forgive me for upsetting you. She's going to go, dude, I need a little more than that. And I need to give her chapter and verse about why I upset her. And I know why. I know what I did. I know every step of it. I know what I was thinking. I may not share that with her. But I'm going to at least tell her what I did. God knows. He wants you to confess, to agree with Him. Is the whole idea. It's to come to Him, right? And you'll notice those same three words for sin are using that passage. So it's the idea there's no holding back on God. Thirdly, the third Selah. Confession reconnects us to God. When we look at it, he says, For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you have, may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. When we bear our hearts to the Lord, relationship is restored. That's what I was saying earlier. You guys remember being kids you get on the outs with your parents they're kind of looking at you a little dark you just know there's something wrong there until you go to them in humility and say mommy daddy forgive me kids don't do that really really well we're more like sorry right but right don't do that with god ask him to forgive but when we do we remember and we recognize how good he is but the bottom line, folks, as we wrap this up, is don't be hard-headed about this. Did you see that? Here at the end, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. We don't know whether it's the psalmist talking or whether it's God talking through the psalmist, or, you know, how, exactly what he's doing there. But, do you really want God dragging you around by a bridle? No, you want to have a relationship with Him that's free and open and joyful is the whole idea. Because newsflash, God doesn't want to be dragging you around either. He wants you to come to Him joyfully and will, willingly. Because He says here at the end of this verse, this, this psalm, He says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Unconfessed sin leads to more sorrows. But, when you have that short sin account, listen to this. But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, 
and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And so as we close, let me ask you, have you gotten real with God? If you're not able to have that joy, that rejoicing, that gladness, that happiness that I was just talking about, let me encourage you today, right now, when we pray, go to the Lord. Talk to Him honestly. Let Him see your whole heart. He already knows. He's just waiting for you to agree with Him. That's how we deal with sin. Let's bow our heads.